looked at linear independence of functions. So it's a little strange. Just to review really quickly, it doesn't mean that the constants, the linear combination of constants work for some x, but they work for all x's. So zero for all x's. So it's a little bit strange. Slightly different than your just standard linear independence of variables or vector. I should not say linear independence of variables. Linear independence of constant vectors is very different than linear independence of functions. So this is theorem 19.2. And we have n continuous functions. So we're going to begin with writing those down. f1, f2 of x, dot, 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 fn of x. So suppose, and q of x. Uh, suppose r continuous on interval i. So the reason we're just writing interval i, it could be open or closed, or half open, half closed, doesn't matter. And just remember, if you're continuous on an open side, you're not continuous at the, so if we did some easy interval like 0 to 1, this means you would be, you don't need to include 0 in your continuity, but you would need to be continuous at 1 on one side, on the inside. Meaning from the, in this interval, from the negative side, from the left side, you'd have to be continuous. So we have, we're supposing your function is continuous on i and fn is not 0 or all x. So that means it's not always 0. Then a linear ODE. So this ODE will be first coefficient function Fn times y. So what does that weird exponent on y mean in parentheses? So this is the nth derivative. So if you put a parentheses, if you see that at your bank, it means you owe them money. But if you see this as an exponent, it means the derivative. So that's the nth derivative. Have I used that notation in this class? I think so. I, think. I may have. So I'll just write a little note. I'll do it in blue. There's lots of reasons to use this notation if you're taking the seventh derivative. It's a little silly to write y like that. I think we have talked about that. I think like the fourth derivative is where it starts to become a little silly to write tick marks. I remember that conversation. So the other problem is I don't know how many what, what value n is, it could be any value, so I can't just write some tick mark, so we just use letter n. And that's the first, and then plus, and this pattern is just going to continue the next function and the next lower derivative of y plus dot 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 plus f1x. Now I can write y prime. If you want to keep the pattern going, you can put the 1. Well, it's a prime if it's not in parentheses. If you put it in parentheses, it's a 1, except it means the first derivative. So you can write it either way. Uh, plus f0 of x. And the pattern would continue the 0 derivative of y, which means take no derivatives of y. So it's also the same thing as regular y. Uh, equals q to the x or q of x. All right, this has exactly one solution. So 
So it'll be a function of x satisfying initial conditions. So y0 derivative of some x value equals y0, y first derivative of the same x value equals y1, and the n minus, we don't need, this is an nth degree, so we'll have n constants. If I stopped at yn, because we started at 0, I'd have n plus 1 conditions. So we want to stop at n minus 1. We want n conditions total. So we started at 0, so we had to stop at n minus 1. Or else we would, this would be overdetermined. I'd have more uh, initial conditions than I needed. So this. These are all properties of the derivative, basically. So this has exactly one solution with these initial conditions. And this solution is called the particular solution. Is that the answer? <laughs> <laughs> so the solution is called the initial condition. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Particular solution. Sorry. All right. So now, this big theorem, all right. This theorem, by the way, doesn't tell you how to solve it at all. It just says there's going to be a solution. So in some sense, it's very unhelpful. So this is what they call an existence theorem, not a constructive theorem. So it doesn't help you construct one. It just says there'll be a solution. So now we have a new definition. I hope we haven't used the word homogeneous. No, we did, of course. That functions that had that nice uh, the order power where you could change variables like u equals x over y or y over x and then you could change them around. Uh, unfortunately this homogeneous means something completely different. So this is describing a homogeneous ODE. Those before that was homogeneous functions or an ODE with homogeneous coefficients. So it was describing functions. This one is describing the differential equation. So the homogeneous ODE is of the form, basically when Q of X equals zero. So if you have your, all of your Y derivatives on one side and your, the part that has no Y's in it or Y primes doesn't appear. That's what this means. So if we look at our, where's Q of X? Our Q of X on the right side. What does everything on the left side have that the right side has none of? The short answer is it's got Y's, or Y primes, or Y prime, 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 et cetera. So the right side's got no Y's. So it's homogeneous when uh, everything that doesn't have a Y is zero. So now we have theorem 19.3, which tells us how to construct solutions from other solutions. So we got the same functions, f0. Let's not keep writing of x every time, f1 fn 
and Q are continuous on some domain D. That's generally going to be an interval, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an interval. Most of our domains are the, at least an interval or a union of some intervals. We keep our domains pretty reasonable. D. The homogeneous ODE. So the homogeneous ODE is uh, has a Q Q of x equal to zero. So this is the same one we looked at before. This will be f n y nth derivative f n minus one y n minus first derivative. Did we start? Yeah, we just start there. Plus f just regular f y. Well, we'll go f prime. No, not f prime. F1 y prime plus F0 y equals, now this is the important part, zero on the right side. That's what makes this homogeneous. So everything that's got no y's or y primes is zero. So this homogeneous ODE has n linearly independent solutions, and they call this a family. A family. So we'll call these I just realized this notation is bad because we used it to mean something completely different. So we'll scroll back up after this and change what was there before. So we're going to get n functions that are all solutions and in your linearly independent. So that is one part of the one conclusion. The other conclusion, uh, the linear combination is also a solution. So this linear combination, I'll write it as y c of x, c is for combo or combination. So it's going to be adding up all these and putting constant in front. And this is k equals z, z, 1, not 0, 1 to n. So that's what linear combination looks like in summation notation. So we don't have to keep writing out dot, dot, dot. Linear combination is also a solution. And this is called the general solution. So if you add up all the small or particular solutions, you get a general solution. There's also a particular, or we'll just write it as y. So we called the other one the linear combination, or yc of x. And this yp of x. So this is the solution to, and I'll use asterisk here to refer to the original one we wrote down somewhere, way up here. 
So that's what I'm referring to. Original with q of x not equal to 0, necessarily. So it's a solution to the non-homogeneous ODE. where y p of x is the oh this is the particular solution and I think we wrote it down up above so basically you get the homogeneous solution the general homogeneous plus the particular you can add these two together and this will still be a solution. So there's sort of two parts. There's the homogeneous part and the particular part. And let me make sure I named it particular above and we'll change particular, there we go. So this I scrolled back to theorem 19.2, and I'm going to change around some of the notation a tiny bit. This exact one exact solution, I shouldn't use the word exact, this one solution, we're going to call it yp of x right here, instead of just y of x. So this is particular to the q of x. If I change q of x, I would get a different uh, solution here. And that's a particular solution. And the other thing, we reuse the y's to mean something different. Right here, they're supposed to be all constants. Down here, they are, right here, functions, not constant. So we'll fix that by writing c's for constants. That makes me feel a lot better. So we got c0, c1, dot, 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 c, and minus 1. So those are supposed to be constants. So what we're going to do is start out with, so I haven't told you at all how to solve these things. So we're going to start out with easier uh, linear ODEs and then work into more difficult ones. So that's how we're going to develop some solutions. So we think about what would be the easiest type, and don't cheat and look ahead to the next section in your book. What are the easiest continuous functions you could think of if we're picking continuous functions? Linear is pretty easy. Let's go easier. Constant. constant. Fantastic. So let's do constant functions. Now, if they're all zero, it's pretty boring. You got uh, zero equals, that's really not even ODE at all. So they're all zero. That's not worth doing. So the next easiest one is constants. So we're just going to assume they're all constants. And, and somewhere around here, this is kind of like the leading term of a polynomial not being zero, because then you would call it a lower degree polynomial. This just says a leading coefficient function shouldn't be zero, because then you would be calling it a higher degree ODE than it actually is. So we don't want to have our leading coefficient function always zero. So we'll go into the next section. And this is homogeneous linear ODE with constant coefficients. So we're assuming for all the k values, we'll just use ck. So it'll be a different constant for each. Actually, ak. I think that's what your book's going to use. All right, so our ODE becomes, I'm going to 
flip back. I don't want to rewrite it here. I'm just going, I'm looking at uh, theorem 19.2, and our fn x is now a n y n derivative plus a n minus 1 y n minus 1 plus dot 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 a1 y prime plus a0 equals, we're assuming it's homogeneous, so we got 0 on the right side. So that's our ODE. So the reason this is complicated is that there's high derivatives. There's not just a, I think we've only dealt with first degree. So I've only dealt with, uh, we've checked solutions on higher degree, but we haven't gotten derived solutions from higher degrees. So this is our first higher degree differential equation. So what I'm going to do now is suppose the solution looks like this. Oh yeah, absolutely. So it is not y to the 0, it is 0 derivatives of y. So you could, could write that, but we know you don't really need the um, 0 derivative right there. All right, so we're going to suppose the solution is y equals e to the mx what values of m will solve this ODE? So how are we going to go about answering this question? When in doubt, what should you do? Take derivative. So in this case, we need to take n derivatives and plug it in. So we're going to pretend or suppose that this is a solution. We're going to figure out what m values would actually make this work. So let's go ahead and take some derivatives. So we're going to plug it in and check. So we'll do y prime first. I'm going to write my derivatives in parentheses notation so it matches what, what we're going to fill back in. So I'll start out with y0 is e to the mx. y1 m e to the mx. And y2 m m or m squared e to the mx. Do I need to keep going to see for the pattern to be obvious? So we can just write down yk for any k value is m to the k e to the mx. And that's for any k between 0 and n. So we're just going to fill all these in right here. So just swap out all of your y to whatever derivative with all these right here. So it's not too difficult to plug this in. Just got to be a little careful with the subscripts and powers. So any questions on plugging that in? What out? So there's no more calculus in this problem. All calculus is behind us. How do I figure out what m values would solve this? What algebra move can I make? Factor e to the mx out, definitely. And we're left.
left with an. Whoa, there's way more than just an. An m to the n plus an minus one m n minus one plus stuff plus a one m plus a zero. All right, zero product property. We just showed, I think, last two classes ago, last class, e to the mx never zero. Even for complex numbers, never zero. So what can I conclude, given that the second part, the second product's never zero? Everything on the left zero. Yep, our first one has to be zero. So zero product property, second one's not zero. I know the first guy has to be zero. So our ZPP means first term is zero. And this looks like a good time for summation notation. We'll start k equals zero to, uh-oh. Is it okay to miss? Yeah, I don't have an M on. I'm about to write summation notation, so I need an m raised to a power, so the pattern is the same. What power can I raise m to in the last term? Zero. We'll go m to the zero power, so then every term looks the same. So we got a. So we'll start. Yeah, we'll just go a k m k, a sub k m super k. To n. So all the AKs are constant. We have to just choose which m satisfy this. Maybe it's not the best form to see it in. What if I change the letters around to some nice friendly ones? All you did was set m equal to x and just swapped out letters. What is this? It's an equation, but what type? Maybe, in some cases. It's polynomial. Nth degree polynomial. Coefficients and powers of x or powers of m. But the a's are the numbers constant, and we have to figure out what x values, or in our case, what m values, satisfy this. So this is basically a pre-calculus one question. So hopefully you remember pre-calculus one, or you have your textbook around, you can look back. So it's a polynomial. So let's give it a proper name. P of M is that summation that I wrote down. So I'm going to write of M now. X was just something so you can see it temporarily. It was obviously a polynomial. I just did that. Uh, X means something different. It doesn't mean these values. X is uh, somewhere around here. It's the input for our solution function. So it can also equal these random constant values that we're supposed to figure out. So I'm going to cross this one out. These x's mean something completely different. All right, so this polynomial is called the characteristic. Well, it's a characteristic polynomial. If we set it equal to 0, it's called the characteristic equation. So from your years of studying polynomials and figuring out, so we're basically finding x-intercepts of a polynomial. Uh, well, I don't really necessarily want to say x-intercepts. So x-intercepts assumes the solutions are real, but they could be real numbers or they could be imaginary or complex numbers. So 
we'll look at the different cases if they're all real uh, or if they are complex. And of course, you could have repeated real or complex values. So there are some different possibilities. So possible roots, possible types of roots, I should say. We have an example coming up in like one minute. I know it's a lot of theory. Types of roots. So roots are real and distinct. And this is 20B. Uh, yeah, it probably would be a theorem because the next sentences, solutions are these forms right here. So we got m, do we start at m0? Or yeah, we went from 0 to n. So there should be n, this is an nth degree. When you, so even though there's n plus one terms, it's really an n degree polynomial. So there should be n solutions. And it has n solutions. Now plenty of these could be repeats. So you might have four that are repeated and two other ones. So we're just gonna write n solutions and there may be repeats. So roots are real and distinct. So we have n distinct real solutions. So what we get, y1 will be e to the m1x, y2 will be e to the m2x, y n e to the m n x. So this one is pretty straightforward, boring. It's pretty much what you expect. These are your n, uh, what do we call these? Not particulars. Well, if we add them all up, they will be the, the family something. Somewhere to underlined, the linear combination will be the general solution. So this linear combination will be the general solution. All right, so we'll do two example problems here. And we got y triple prime plus 2y double prime minus y prime minus 2y equals 0. So before we get started, how, so of course it's in this section, so it's homogeneous linear ODE. How do you know it's not going to be exact or any of those other types we looked at before? Well, what gives it away? It couldn't be any type we saw before. It's not linear. Doesn't have anything to do with linear. It's not first order. Not first order. So everything we did before, I can instantly tell won't work here without, I mean, the coefficients are as nice as it gets, constant numbers everywhere. But that fact that we have a double and triple derivative, you can't do any of that techniques you saw before. So that right there tells me uh, everything I learned so far won't be useful here. All, well, all the tricks we learned, you'll still need calculus. All right, so we're gonna solve it. You know what the, somewhere, So we're going to suppose all of our solutions look like uh, e to different m values. So first thing, let 
let y equal e to the mx. We're going to need to find some different m values. And you need to find y prime, y double prime, y triple prime. Plug in, factor, solve your characteristic. Maybe I'll do the first few steps. So there's our third degree, third degree po m polynomial that we need to solve. So let's see what your precalculus skills are made of. You might be able to factor. I suggest other tricks, like rational zero theorem. You'll probably have more success that way. So take a minute, see what you can remember. So if rational zero theorem, you forgot that, where's a good place to go? Textbook. Textbook, but not your textbook. Your differential equation probably won't talk at all about rational zero. I doubt it's even in the index. So that'll be your pre-calculus textbook. I don't think your calculus textbook, maybe they, they might have written they have a written it down once or twice, but, but they don't, they're not going to learn the rational zero theorem. So you need to go back to your pre-cal one textbook for rational zero theorem. You can also Google. Um, so basically, in a very, very fast nutshell, it's the factors of the constant uh, coefficient divided by factors of the leading coefficient. And you have to try them all. What do you do when you find a 0? We're not done. This is only one of the three. We're a third of the way there. So we, we need to find the other two. How do we? So we have a solution. So this corresponds to a factor. What factor does this correspond to? The one that, if you plug in that value, would make it 0. So this corresponds to m minus 1, which tells us that we can write m cubed plus 2m squared minus m minus 2 factors into m minus 1 times something, I can tell for sure it's going to be a quadratic. How do I find that quadratic? Synthetic division or regular division. So we got to do division here. So we found a factor. A factor is something that you 
can divide by. So n minus 1 So it's a good place to end because of time reasons. And also, if rational zero theorem, if you forgot that, I strongly recommend you go and review your pre-calculus and return a solution into a factor. That's the big theorem from pre-calculus class. And you can also go and look at my pre-calculus one notes. Those are all online too. And they're organized, they're nice organized by section.